All right, let's all stand and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. from here it all used to seem so clear I'm finding I can't do this on my own I don't know where to go from here as long as I know that you are near I'm done fighting I'm finally letting go I will trust in you you've never failed before I will trust in you If there's a road I should walk Help me find it If I need to be still Give me peace for the moment Whatever your will Whatever your will Can you help me find it? Can you help me find it? me faith, I give you doubt, you give me grace, for every step I've never been alone, even when it hurts you'll have your way, even in the valley I will say, with every breath you never let me go, I will wait for you, you've never failed before. I will wait for you If there's a road I should walk Help me find it If I need to be still Give me peace for the moment Whatever your will Whatever your will Can you help me find it? Can you help me find it? Give me peace for the moment Whatever your will Whatever your will Can you help me find it? Can you help me find it? Can you help me find it? Can you help me find God, that each and every one of us would look to you right now, that you would minister to our hearts, that you would speak to us, and that we would respond to you. That we would not just go through, through the motions, but that we would truly and sincerely worship you and express our love and gratitude to you with all of our heart, with all of our mind and soul and strength. Lord, we are so grateful. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins and giving us eternal life when we just place our faith and trust in you. And so, Father, I pray that each and every one of us 
would experience your presence and your power in this place right here and right now. And then when, when we leave, we will know without a doubt that we've been with God. And so, Father, bless this time together. Speak to each and every heart and draw us close to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Before creation, eternity in your hand, you spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before my failures And carried the cross for my shame My sin weighed upon your shoulders My soul now to stand So what can I say? Salvation, your spirit alive in me. This life to declare your promise, my soul now to stand. So, what can I say? So I'll stand with thorns high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all I am is yours. So, Lord, to you surrendered all I am is yours. Sing it one more time. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. I'll stand by soul. 
So Lord, to you surrendered all I am is yours. All I am is yours. All I am is yours. So what can I say? Hey, and what can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely. stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I Searching for answers Far and wide But I know We're all searching for answers Only you provide Cause you know Just what we need Before we say a word You're a good, good father it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us, alien. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. Are and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Amen. Thank you, praise team.
That was a new song. I like that song. All right. Uh, just, um, there's not really any announcements. You can just uh, look on the inside of your bulletin. Um, the women had a great time yesterday, I understand, and, and uh, they had over 20 ladies, and it uh, sounded like a, a really great event. And uh, they have other things uh, coming up here in the month of February, and so put those things on your calendar. The women's ministry actually is probably the most active <laughs> ministry uh, that we have here at West Phoenix, and ladies, uh, you should get involved. It's a really great ministry. Um, that's all the announcements I have, and uh, if you're here for the first time or first time in a long time, you're our special guest. I know Scott, uh, Scotty brought out a friend, John, and, and his family. Go ahead. Uh, Scott, introduce the, the whole bunch there. Kim, so nice to have you. Let's see, and who else here do we have over here out for the first time? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, introduce yourself there, uh, would you? Please, go ahead. So nice to have you, Sergio, you said? Yeah, so nice to have you. Someone else, someone else. All right. Well, let's all stand and greet one another. We have an awesome God, don't we? When he rolled up the sleeves, the angels putting on the ribs. Our God is an awesome God. There is thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fists. Our God is an awesome God. The Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very close, so you better be believing that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Starless in the void of the night Our God is an awesome God He spoke into the darkness and created the light Our God is an awesome God Judgment and wrath he poured out on Sodom Mercy and grace he gave us at the cross I hope that we have not too quickly forgotten That our God is an awesome God Our God is an awesome God He raised it from I'll never let 
pretty good job directing that, by the way. <laughs> you know, Mason used to be music, music director here at West Phoenix many moons ago. And he selected most of my favorite songs today, by the way. <laughs> Loved all those songs. Well, when I was a kid, when I was in high school in particular, I used to come home to the house, and my grandmother used to have her own little apartment over here to the left. I'd walk into the foyer, and every time I walk in, she'd say, friend or foe? Do you remember that, JoJo? Macy remembers. Friend or foe? I'd look over, it's just me, Nana. Honey, come here. Honey, are you happy? She'd always say, honey, are you happy? I said, yeah, I'm happy. She said, well, the most important thing in life is to be happy. And you know what she was telling me when she said that? She wasn't saying that I should always be laughing and have giggly. And she, said, she was saying, you always have to have that inner peace and joy that comes with being a Christian. That's what she was telling me. Well, I want to share a little song this morning about joy, done by the, one of mine and Mason's favorite groups way back in the early 70s, the Imperials. And the Imperials did this, made this song famous. Many other people sang it as well. And uh, man, it talks about, are you struggling with problems and trials and tribulations and sorrow? Well. Give them all to Jesus, and he will turn those sorrows into joy. <laughs> Are you tired of chasing pretty rainbows? Are you tired of spinning round and round? Wrap up all those shadow dreams of your life and At the feet of Jesus lay them down Give them all, give them all Give them all to Jesus Shadow dreams, wounded hearts, broken toys Give them all, give them all, give them all to Jesus, and He will turn your sorrow into joy. He never said you'd only see sunshine. He never said there'd be no rain He only promised a heart full of singing About the very things that once brought pain Give them all, give them all Give them all to Jesus Shadow dreams wounded hearts broken toys give them all give them all give them all to Jesus and he will turn your sorrow into joy
Thank you, Butch. Always love to hear the trumpet. That brings back a lot of memories, too. <laughs> Let's pray together, shall we? Father in heaven, we know that <clears throat> we can only have joy if, when we trust in you, when we look to you, and that you want to give us joy. <clears throat> Even when we go through trials and tribulations and hardships in our life, we still can have that inner peace, that inner joy when we trust in you. So, Father, I pray right now that you would give that joy, uh, that joy inside to each and every one here as we reflect on your goodness and your greatness. And, Father, I pray that as your message is presented, that you will use me as a tool, that you would fill me with your spirit, that every word that comes out of my mouth will come directly from you, and that everyone will know that this is your message. It's not my message, but it's your message that you want to affect each and every heart here this morning. And I pray, God, that each and every one of us would rediscover the greatness of God. That you are awesome. That you love us so greatly. And so, Father, help us to listen to your message, respond to it, and look to you for guidance in our lives and that your will would be done in this church and in our each and everyone's life. So, Father, use this time right now to bring honor and glory to yourself, to speak to each and every heart here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Two men were standing at the Grand Canyon, looking in the Grand Canyon, and seeing the depth, the great depth of this world-famous canyon, the one man says, this is the hand of God. I am absolutely amazed. The guy standing next to him spit into the canyon. He said, that is the first time I ever spit a mile. I guess it's all how you look at things. <laughs> We have become dull to the greatness of God. We have become dull to the greatness of God. If a dead man is raised from the dead, we're all shocked, right? Yet every day, one that had no, no being is born. And no one wonders. The birth of a child is a greater miracle than bringing someone back to life. In the Old Testament, the high priest, Aaron, he had this dried up stick, this rod that all of a sudden budded. All of a sudden, a flower budded on this dry stick, and everyone is just astonished. Yet every day a tree is produced from the dry earth, and no one wonders. 5,000 men were fed with only five loaves of bread and two fish. And everyone was amazed. Yet every day the grains of seed that are sown are multiplied into corn and other foods that feed millions. And nobody wanders. All wondered to see water turned into to wine. Yet every day the earth's moisture being drawn into the root of the vine is turned by the grape into wine. And no one wanders. We have become dull to the greatness of God. And Psalm 147.5 says, Great is the Lord, and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. God's great power is seen through all creation. God's power is unlimited. It amazes me how God can make a black cow eat green grass that gives white milk that makes yellow butter. That's amazing to me. And today, I really want us to take a closer look at God's creation. Now, as we look closer at God's creation, we will rediscover God's greatness. And when we see God's greatness 
it will cause us to, instead of focusing on ourselves, it will take our eyes off of ourselves. It will take our eyes off of our problems. And we will begin to trust God. We'll begin to trust God. And when we trust God more, then and only then will we live a fruitful, productive, and effective life. Do you want to live a fruitful, productive, and effective life? You got to trust God. And if you're going to trust God, you've got to discover and see the greatness of God. And so turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. You'll love these verses. As I study them this week, I, I just love, love reading these verses. There's so much here in Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5 through 8. Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 through 8. It says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. But blessed or happy is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for it leaves, its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Now I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you more like the shrub in the desert who trusts in yourself and in other human beings? Or are you like the tree planted by waters, one who trusts in God? Look at verse 8 again. Notice that the tree planted by the water does not fear when heat comes. When the summer comes, you're not afraid. Notice that the tree planted by the water does not worry in the year of drought. So when you're in a heated situation, when you're up a against a, a rock in a hard place, you're between a rock and a hard place, when you really have a, a, a dilemma on your hands, when tragedy strikes, when you don't have any money to pay your bills, how do you respond? Do you trust God? Or do you respond with fear, panic, and worry? Look at verse 6. The shrub in the desert will not see any good come course that's right. Worry, if you worry, if you fear, no good can come from worry. No good can come from panic. It's only going to make things worse. But the tree planted by water does not fear, is not anxious, it does not cease to bear fruit. Are you bearing fruit? Look at verse 7. Blessed or happy is the man who trusts in the Lord whose trust is in the Lord. Are you bearing fruit? Are you living a productive, effective, fruitful life? Are you trusting in the Lord? Are you like a shrub in the desert or a tree planted by the waters? Now, the reason people don't trust the Lord is because they have become dull to the greatness of God. Romans 1.20 says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. There's no excuse not to believe in God. The evidence is all around us in all of his creation. There's no excuse not to believe in God. God has revealed his power and his glory and his greatness through his creation. Consider the rotation of the earth. Our globe spins on its axes at the rate of 1,000 miles an hour. Just spins the earth, the globe. 
If it were just a hundred miles an hour, our days and nights would be ten times as long. The vegetation would freeze in the long night, or it would burn in the long day, and there would be no life. Consider the heat of the sun. 12,000 degrees at surface temperature, the heat of the sun. And we're just far enough away to be blessed by that terrific heat. If the heat gave off half of its radiation, we would all freeze to death. If it gave off one half more, we would all be crispy critters. Consider the slant of the earth, 23 degrees. If it were different than that, the vapors from the oceans would ice over the continents and there would be no life. It was just a little different degree. Consider the moon. If the moon were 50,000 miles away rather than its present distance, twice a day, giant tides would totally inundate every bit of land mass on the earth. In other words, there would be tidal waves that would cover the entire earth two times a day if the moon were 50,000 miles away. Consider the crust of the earth, just a little thicker and there would be no life because there would be no oxygen. Consider the atmosphere. If our atmosphere was just a little thinner, the millions of meteors now burning themselves out in space would plummet this earth into oblivion. Consider the human brain. There was an atheist and a Quaker. They were arguing over the existence of God, and, and the atheist asked them, well, did you ever see God? No. Did you ever smell God? No. And the atheist said with a smirk on his face, well, how can you be sure that there really is God? And of course, the Quaker asked the atheist, well, have you ever seen your brain? Have you ever smelled your brain? Well, how do you know that you really have brains? If you have any brains at all, you would have to come to the conclusion that there really is a God. And to say that a well-precisioned, mathematically created universe just happened is about as credible as Webster's unabridged dictionary was accidentally published by an explosion in a printing factory or that a Boeing 747 airplane was assembled when a tornado swept through a junkyard. That's how ridiculous it would be. Dwayne Gish, the noted biologist, says, evolution is a fairy tale for adults. In Grimm's fairy tale, someone kisses a frog and two seconds later it becomes a prince. We call that a fairy tale. In evolution, someone kisses a frog and two million years later, they become a prince, and we call that science. Evolution is indeed a fairy tale for adults. Now, can God be trusted to bring you through the tough times? Because we all face tough times. Can he be trusted? And last week, we studied the story of how God parted the Red Sea, how the Jewish people were in a real predicament they were backed up against the wall of, of a sea, the Red Sea. They were like in a cul-de-sac down a dead-end street with no place to go. And the Egyptian army was in hot pursuit of them, wanted to kill them. They were in a real predicament. What did they do? What did God say? Well, we, we studied Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. God told them, when their backs were up against the wall, when they had, were in a real dilemma, God says, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. And so the lesson that we learned is that when we're backed up against the wall, when we're between a rock and a hard place, when we have a real dilemma on our hands, trust God and place your hope in Him. He will provide a way. Trust God and move forward.
He will always provide a way. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. People often say that, well, God has to show me his power. Then I'll believe. If I see God's power, then I'll believe. But he has shown his power. The evidence is all around us. When Job was going through the suffering that he went through, you know the story of Job in the Bible. And he went through tremendous suffering and pain and sorrow and tragedy struck him and in, in his home. And Job questioned God's power and his greatness. And what was God's response to Job? Well, he asked Job a question. Very interesting question. God said to Job, in Job 38, verse 4, he says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? The interesting question. When you're going through suffering, and, and Job, and you question God's power, you question his greatness, he says, to us, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? In other words, I didn't have to get advice from you. I didn't have to get help from you to pull, to pull this thing off. Yet so many people only trust themselves. They, they trust in other people. They trust their friends more than they trust in God. Instead of turning to God, they, they, they turn to their friends. Or they trust themselves even more than God. You didn't help God create the universe. He did it all by himself. And if he, he can create the universe, he can create you and I. He certainly can take care of your problems. Let me ask you, are you a shrub in the desert? Or are you a tree planted by the waters that cease uh, to b bear fruit? Are you productive? Are you effective? Now, since we're talking about God's creation, I want to I just give one example of God's creation. It's very useful. And it's trees. I did a lot of study on trees. And trees are very, very useful. Let me tell you about trees. God created trees. Trees provide oxygen for all living creatures. If, it didn't have, if we didn't have trees, there could be no life. Trees provide much of our food that we eat, as you know. Trees provide wood for use for fire, to keep us warm, for cooking, and for building houses and other things. Trees protect the soil. Trees provide our greatest source of paper. Trees provide shelter for the birds and insects. Many of the medicines that we use today uh, for cancer and other illnesses are from the trees. I know Paxil and aspirin are, are um, made from tree bark. The cross that Jesus died on was made from a tree. The tree is the longest living of all God's creation on earth. Did you know that? The trees are the longest living of all God's creation on earth. Trees are mentioned in the Bible more than any other living thing in the Bible except for human beings. Trees are also the first living of God's creation on earth. Trees were created on the third day, remember. The first day was light. Second day was the expanse. Third day was trees and plant life. That's the first of God's creation that was actually living. The very beginning of the Bible and the very end of the Bible mentions the tree of life. Now, folks, I'm not a tree hugger. I like trees, but I'm not a tree hugger. But that's a pretty good resume. That's a pretty good resume, trees. Trees are important, and they're useful. But I want you to know this morning that even though trees are useful and helpful and important, that we as humans are more important than trees. In fact, 
all of God's creation was made for human beings. We're studying creation on Wednesday night. And we saw there on Wednesday night that God made all of the creation for human beings, for us. That's why we were created last on the sixth day. Because we needed all the other things on the earth here in order to survive. The trees, not only the trees, but everything else that was created. In order for us to survive. And God gave us everything on this earth for us. And we were also the only creatures made in God's image. And so we were made for a much greater purpose than trees. Philippians 1.21 sums it all up. What our purpose is in life. And the Apostle Paul says his purpose for life, for living, is Christ. He says, for me to live is Christ. That's our purpose for living. The reason that we are here, everything that we do should be centered around Christ. He is our purpose for living. Can you say, for me to live is Christ? Everything that I do, everything that I say, the reason that I'm here is because of Christ. Your, our focus needs to be on Him. What are you doing for Christ? Are you living for Christ? Can you say, for me to live is Christ? We are God's representatives on the earth. Romans 8, 28, 29. I know... Um, many people's favorite verses here, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. See, God is not saying here that, that he will make all the circumstances of life end on a happy note. And that's a misinterpretation that we all say. You know, all things work together for good, and we just leave it at that. God's not saying that all the circumstances of life are going to end on a happy note. See, he's saying that in and through all of the circumstances that we face, his good purpose in us is being and will be accomplished. Despite the circumstances that we face, despite the tragedies that we face, if you love God and you're called according to his purpose, which we are, then God's going to take all the circumstances in life, whatever we face, that's not going to stop us from moving forward and accomplishing God's will on the earth because God has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of our, our lives. And so he's going to guide us and, and, and a broken leg or a health problem or a disability is not going to prevent us or stop us from accomplishing God's will for our life on this earth. God still has a purpose for each and every one of us. And like I said before, you wouldn't be here if God was through with you. And so God still has something for you to do, a purpose, and it centers around Christ. And so as long as we are serving him and doing what Christ wants us to do, then no matter what we face in life, all the bad things as well as the good things, those things are not going to get in the way of us accomplishing God's will in this world, God's purpose, you see. And we are created to be fruitful and to multiply. Now, I've got to hand it to my mom and dad. They sure took this, this command and ran with it because they had eight children. And they, they said, God says be fruitful and multiply, and they, they, they did. And, uh, <laughs> but all throughout the Bible, it's saying more than, you know, have children. Because what about single people? And all through the Bible, it, when God talks about being fruitful, he's talking about making spiritual children, making disciples, go and make disciples, reaching people for Christ. See, the Apostle Paul said about Timothy, my son in the Lord, in the faith, in 1 Timothy. And when you lead someone to the Lord, that, that person becomes your child in the faith, you see. And that's what we are called to do. When Eddie Cadell was 13 years old, I led Eddie to the Lord. And so he has become my child in the faith. He's my son 
in the faith. And there are others who are my children or my sons and daughters in the faith. I don't have to give birth or Kelly doesn't have to give birth for them to be my sons and daughters in the faith, you see. And so God has called all of us to make spiritual children, to lead people to Christ so that you might have sons and daughters in the faith as well. I want to ask you, how useful are you? I'd like to close on a, with a story, a tale of three trees. Some of you may have heard this story before. Once upon a mountaintop, three little trees stood and dreamed of what they wanted to become when they grew up. The first little tree looked up at the stars and said, I want to hold treasure. I want to be covered with gold and filled with precious stones. I'll be the most beautiful treasure chest in the world. The second little tree looked out at the small stream trickling by on its way to the ocean. I want to be traveling mighty waters and carrying powerful kings. I'll be the strongest ship in the world. The third little tree looked down into the valley below where businessmen and women worked in a busy town. I don't want to leave the mountaintop at all. I want to grow so tall that when people stop to look at me, they'll raise their eyes to heaven and think of God. I will be the tallest tree in the world. Well, years passed. The rain came, the sun shone, and the little trees grew tall. One day, three woodcutters climbed the mountain. The first woodcutter looked at the first tree and said, This tree is beautiful. It is perfect for me. With a swoop of his shining axe, the first tree fell. Now I shall be made into a beautiful chest. I shall hold wonderful treasure, the first tree said. The second woodcutter looked at the second tree and said, This tree is strong. It's perfect for me. And with a swoop of his shining axe, the second tree fell. Now I shall sail mighty waters, thought the second tree. I shall be strong, a strong ship for mighty kings. Third tree felt her heart sink. When the last woodcutter looked her way, she stood straight and tall and pointed bravely to heaven. But the woodcutter never even looked up. Any kind of tree will do for me, he muttered. With a swoop of his shining axe, the third tree fell. The first tree rejoiced when the woodcutter brought her to the carpenter shop. But the carpenter fashioned the tree into a feed box for animals. The once beautiful tree was not covered with gold, nor of treasure. She was coated with sawdust and filled with hay for hungry farm animals. The second tree smiled when the woodcutter took her to the shipyard, but no mighty sailing ship was made that day. Instead, the one strong tree was hammered and sawed into a simple fishing boat. She was too small and too weak to sail on an ocean or even in a river. Instead, she was taken to a little lake. The third tree was confused when the woodcutter cut her into strong beams and left her in the lumberyard. What happened? The once tall tree wondered. All I ever wanted was to stay on the mountaintop and point to God. Many, many days and nights passed. The three trees never forgot their dreams. But one night, golden starlight poured over the first tree as a young woman placed her newborn baby in the feed box. I wish I could make a cradle for him, her husband whispered. The mother squeezed his hand and smiled as the starlight shone on the smooth and sturdy wood. This manger is beautiful, she said. And suddenly the first tree knew he was holding the greatest treasure in the world. One evening, a tired traveler and his friends crowded into a, an old fishing boat. The traveler fell asleep as the second tree quietly sailed out into the lake. Soon a thundering and thrashing storm arose. The little tree shuddered. She knew she did not have the strength to carry so many passengers safely through the wind and the rain. The tired man awakened. He stood up, stretched out his arms, and said, Peace, and the storm stopped as quickly as it had begun. And suddenly... The second tree knew he was carrying the king of heaven and earth. On Friday morning, the third tree was startled when her beams were yanked from the forgotten woodpile. She flinched as she was carried through an angry, jeering crowd. She shuddered when soldiers nailed a man's hand to her. She felt ugly and harsh and cruel. But on Sunday morning, when the sun rose and the earth trembled with joy beneath her, the third tree knew 
that God's love had changed everything. It had made the third tree strong. And every time people thought of that third tree, they would think of God. That was better than being the tallest tree in the world. And you see, God wants to use you and I to point people to him. And if God can use a tree, he's got even plan, greater plans for you and me. Can you say, along with the Apostle Paul, for me to live is Christ. Let's bow for prayer. Our great Heavenly Father, I know that there are people here who are struggling, going through hard times right now, good people, people who love you, who are called according to your purpose. And I pray, Lord, that you would wrap your loving arms around them, help them through this difficult time. I pray also, Lord, that you will, as you promised in your word, that you would work through these circumstances, that you would use them to actually accomplish your will. Despite of the hard times that we face, we can still move forward into your care and accomplish your will for our lives. And I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here who doesn't know you as their Savior, that they would trust you today, that they would understand and discover the greatness of God. And that they would place their trust in you to take them to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. With heads bowed, nice closed. God brought you here for a reason. You might be new. You might be a regular member that's been coming out for years. God has given us a question. Are you more like the shrub in the desert where no good can come? Or are you a tree planted by the waters who is fruitful, productive, and effective? Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Have you trusted in Him? Or are you still trusting in yourself? You think you've got it all down. Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross for your sins. He said, if you would just trust me, invite me in your life to be your personal Savior, I will take a hold of your life. You will be a new creation, a new beginning, a fresh start. And when you die, I'll take you to heaven with me. That's a promise from God's word. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the children of God. Specifically to those who believe on his name. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? It's not by works. You can't be good enough to get to heaven. It's all what Jesus did. It's not what you do. You can't trust in your riches. You can't trust in your works. It's all what Jesus did for us. Do you know for sure if you were to die today, you'd be in heaven? If you're just not sure, God is tugging at your heart. You may feel him tugging at your heart. There's a decision for you to make right now. Don't let this opportunity go by. God brought you here for a reason, and that reason is for you right now to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Now, I want you to do something, and it'll take a little bit of courage. And that would be that if you, you want to know Jesus as your personal Savior, I want to pray with you. I want to give you the opportunity right now so that you don't leave this place without Jesus in your heart. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is I want you to pray with me right now. In your seat, just pray in your heart the prayer that I'm going to pray right now and invite Jesus in your life. If you're just not sure, 
I want to pray right now. Here we go. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner and I need you. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and rose from the grave. I accept you into my life. Be my personal Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you just prayed that prayer for the first time in your life, Jesus Christ came into your heart for the first time in your life. And Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. this morning and to receive this message to worship you father we pray that we can claim what paul claimed in first and in philippians for me to live is christ and that we might be fruitful and spread the word of jesus christ the good news and lead others to christ give us a fruitful week now in jesus name amen mm-hmm.